in the shed part of the business around six hundred thousand dollars this year we'll probably do about seven hundred thousand in sales with the three trucks you know some months are sixty thousand dollars that we're pulling into the gym we're gonna say million and a quarter annual revenue what's some of the biggest jobs that you've done and what's some of the smallest ones in terms of revenue and time just give us a little insight into that so i've done a whole spectrum some small projects it could be like a single accent wall those are projects that aren't really going to attract my attention anymore because they're not necessarily worth me showing up for completely unloading early on i could do a project as small as like 200 bucks any I'm not going to show up for just like a half bath. It's probably going to at least be a bedroom or two. On the larger side, I've done giant exteriors. So projects that take two and a half weeks. I've got multiple ladders out there. I finally invested in scaffolding, but then that was my final summer of exterior. Just realizing one man crew for a giant exterior is really not ideal. And it's exhausting. For the exterior one, like how much revenue did that bring in? I think my largest revenue project would be around nine thousand dollars i've also had an interior project go about that high as well all right so can you tell us a little bit about the finances behind the shed business as far as the shed business there's a lot of different ways that people go into the shed business some people build their own and then some people are dealers for uh, manufacturers i'm a dealer for prairie built barns we get a percentage of each shed our average sheds probably between five and six thousand dollars sold and then we get a percent of that so that's where the revenue comes for uh being in the shed business in, in your first year selling, how much did you do in revenue? In the shed part of the business, around $600,000. And this year, how much? COVID, COVID last year was a very good year. Um, this year has dropped some. We're going to be closer to the four, 450 range. This year, we'll probably do about 700000 in sales with the three trucks, but that's with, you know, third truck was finally ready by May, so that's only been operating for few months. This truck was out of commission for quite a few weeks this year because of engine issues. You know, some months are $60,000 that we're pulling into the gym, but 75% of that is claimed sometimes, so. We probably went from about 5,000 pretzels year one to about 20,000 pretzels year two. And now, you know, we're close to, yeah, we're, I mean, we're doubling that now. And we're, we're going to be going into our fourth year. So. Revenue and profits aside, I see that our life is better today than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. So that's good. I feel that our staff's lives, those that work here, they're in a good place. They're respected at work. They've got decent home lives. They're making a good living. I can't ask for more. So by design, I think on a, on a we're going to say million and a quarter annual revenue, we probably lose anywhere from two to seven percent by design well right now like our our average built-in size with lowers and uppers and shelves and mantle right now that's probably about eight grand on average and, and part of that is just inflation and materials going up in price we just we've got quite a few projects that have started to hit over ten thousand between ten and twenty thousand in their cost furniture wise our dining tables start around like 26, 2700 and up, depending on the, the design and the size of it. We've done some custom pieces and those are several grand, but they're custom. And so they're a lot more involved in terms of thought and design and execution. With the expenses that you mentioned, what are other expenses that you have monthly or weekly or however you calculate it? General overhead is pretty low. I mentioned the liability insurance, that's 500 a year. It'll be easier if I tell you yearly rather than monthly. 500 for liability, measly 25 for LLC. Other main ones would be, I think, $125 a year for my Squarespace website. 150 for a work phone, which rings through my actual cell phone, but to have the local area code, I have two numbers on my cell phone. Other than that, my expenses are really paint and advertising. Paint is pretty minimal per project, and then just however much I want to advertise at a given time. As far as the shed part, being a dealer, you don't have expenses, but as far as the building, um, probably your liability insurance, and then your taxes, and your utilities are you're gonna be your top three expenses. Probably repairs, honestly. With a food truck, it's never ending. It seems like there's constantly something breaking, something that needs to be fixed, maintained, you know tires, brakes, engine stuff, generator stuff, and then not to mention, you have a commercial kitchen on wheels, so of appliances that aren't meant to be moving around every day, <laughs> bouncing around on the road, and so there's a lot of potential for things to break, but 
like I said, we'll never cancel on a catered customer. We'll never cancel on a bride. So even if something goes down, we have a lot of redundancies in place. We have backup equipment. We have a whole backup oven back there. We have a solution for almost everything that could happen now. So I think the, the number of events that we had to cancel this year is like one or two um, due to, you know, equipment failure type stuff. And then things like, you know, fees to be a part of certain events. For example, Grid Life is a festival that we do that I think it cost about, after everything was calculated, it cost us about four or $5,000 to be a part of that event, which is just one weekend. Uh, and it's a percentage of sales, that's how they do it. Um, Electric Forest used to charge 35%. So we would, be, we would do Electric Forest for a weekend and hand them a 10 grand, $10,000 check. Oh, and then of course food. Food costs are, through the roof right now. Um, we're still probably at about, you know, under under that 28% mark, which we're supposed to be at. The goal for any food service business is to be under 28% food costs. Ours is probably normally about 22 to 24, but during COVID, actually it was more 2021, our bacon was triple. Our cheese almost doubled. Um, pepperoni was double. Everything was outrageous, and then we just had to raise our prices because of it. And a lot of people understood, but it still does impact your sales. Yeah, so our, our biggest expense at our gym is our coaches. So our payroll is our biggest expense. Most gyms with their personal trainings, they, they offer like a 50-50 split, or uh, the gym gets 70% and the coach gets 30% of whatever they offer. I do the complete opposite. I do a 75-25 split. I want my coaches to make good money and I want them to actually invest into the stuff that they do and I want them to be able to live. Because at one point I was a coach and I remember what it was like making like $10, $20 an hour in the gym making 60 You know, it just didn't make sense to me. And obviously they have to have a big beautiful gym to do it. but um, So that's, that's a big piece of how our, our coaches work. And then obviously they get compensated for all the classes and hours they, they coach there. So they're all commission based. They, you know, anytime they're working, they're getting paid. They're not working, they're not getting paid. We're spending thousands a month and it's, it's split uh, mostly, it's labor, ingredients, and uh, disposables, fuel. Uh, we pay a fair amount to vend also. A lot, of t a lot of events charge for vending. Overhead, so I pay rent here and I pay rent at the commissary. They are numerous. They are. So our electric bills alone push about $2,500 a month just for electric. Uh, we run a big glycol chiller that is that runs on electrical and it's expensive. Uh, this building is about $1,600 a month for electric because everything it seems everything. has to be powered. I would love to get solar panels, but I hear they're very expensive. Well, and five years oh. in, if it plugs into a wall, it's breaking down. Yes. Um, so on top of the known day-to-day -day, over our last there, there's a chuckle moves. with us in one of our local um mechanics Mechanical they, they do providers. electrical stuff yeah. for us is on thursday i call and say hey this is tom and here's what we need fixed this week in our last and she chuckles weeks. and it's funny and yeah and then we send a big fat check yeah. in the but last three weeks up. our slowest three weeks of the year yeah. since and early everything January, has broken down in the last we have weeks. had that service company here literally they leave and something else goes down the next day. And call we them know, back, we so. know them all, all the texts by name. Yeah. yeah. So we've gained, that, I mean, that's a good way to gain new customers is our service providers just now a year. So it's, it's we, great. We do see the folks that <laughs> work on our stuff here for doing Yeah, it was a rough week for things getting broken. So, and, and then there's, of course, you know, we have to pay for music licensing. If we have live music, we have to pay for licensing. We have uh, Pandora for business because they cover the licensing of anything that plays. We, there's just everything you look at costs money. If you open a door, it costs me money because the heat has to get gone. Um, it was shocking to me when we first opened how many decisions you had to make and how much you had to pay for things. I, I we used to laugh that if it was anything under a thousand dollars, we were just like, yeah, just spend it because it seems like commercially everything is at least a thousand dollars. And if you, if some, you know, people that don't run a business like this will be like, oh, it's two hundred dollars. I know that sounds pricey. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's 200 bucks. Like, I don't, I don't even think about that. So, um, you know, we do have our brew house lease is coming to an end. We've got one payment Big left, sigh relief. which clears up several thousand dollars a month. Um, so we have some things that are falling off at five years and we made it five years. I think in the restaurant industry, that's a kind of a, that's the first hurdle mile marker. I think one of the challenges of um, operating a cidery is you're starting with a, a fruit. So oftentimes people want to pay 
a similar price for a cider as they would a beer, um, but not fully understanding the kind of cost differential that goes into that. One starts with water and other ingredients, um, but the other is fruit, and so you're kind of naturally at a higher price point. So it's a, I'd say it's a lower margin business than a brewery is, um, and so that's one of our biggest expenses. Obviously, equipment and labor are are equally as as large. Um, it's a unique skill set to be able to really understand how to make cider. It's kind of part like making beer, part like making wine, but part like neither of those. So labor is obviously key and equipment, the same sorts of things apply, um, where it's part like making beer, part like making wine, but there's some nuances to it being cider. So that customization and unique types of equipment are also a very large expense to get started and to continue to grow. It'd be your material cost, it'd be, you know, if you're upgrading equipment, if, you are not working out of your garage or a pole barn on your property, then you're having to lease space. And so then you have rent, you have utilities, you have insurance. When you hire an employee, you have the employee's payroll, you have taxes, you have workers' comp. Like the workers' comp is more than my commercial policy and uh, between the liability and inland marine and truck and trailer. So that's something to keep in mind that you don't always hear about what's called the labor burden and Ryan's not a burden, but uh, the labor burden being that you have your salary, but then you have all those other things. So let's say you're paying someone 20, 25 bucks an hour. Well, that's actually costing you like between 40 and 50 bucks because you have to consider your taxes you have to consider the workers' comp and the insurance. And so that's something to bear in mind. You know, it's not just, oh, you know, he's gonna make say 35, 40K in a year. That's all out of my pocket. Well, no, actually let's add 10% to that, right? So that's affecting your bottom line. In, in our case, because we're a more established business and we have an employee and we're looking to have more employees. Like I said, you have that payroll, you have the insurance, the taxes, um, Clearly we're in an industrial space, so we have rent, you have utilities, uh, we're fortunate to have our utilities and internet included, but if you don't, then you have to consider that access to a dumpster. So there's all these little things that you have when you're running a business that you have to consider. And can you tell us a little bit about how you advertise your business outside of this and any other like marketing, social media tips that you do to get customers? Yeah, definitely. So that's evolved over time. I started off with makeshift like amateur flyers. When I first quit the job with the larger company, went solo. I just had like a generic template I used online. It was like a blue cheesy flyer. I tried to find one, but I couldn't. Had a sunshine on it. And then I would literally stuff it in mailboxes. So either jogging, rollerblading, hanging my arm out the van window, stuffing mailboxes. That eventually evolved to going through the post office. They have direct mailing where on their website, you can select specific neighborhoods and it will show you the actual income of that neighborhood and you drop your stacks of flyers off and they'll deliver them for you. That's pretty pricey though, because you're paying for the cost of the flyers. And then it's uh, these days, because this was a while ago, it's probably at least a quarter per flyer for them to deliver. So if you're doing hundreds or thousands of flyers, that's going to add up. I didn't know that was uh, existed. That's crazy. I was surprised to find out about it too, especially when I'd put like years into manually delivering all the flyers. It was rewarding, like in an afternoon, getting 300 out there and feeling like you conquered a neighborhood, but you're spreading a blanket on a community that maybe no one actually wants painting. So maybe be 300 flyers go out and you get two phone calls. I eventually evolved to, we can shift back over this way, yard signs. This will go any project I'm working on in the front yard, right into the lawn. And then I decided I'm gonna go to busy intersections and just sprinkle these around town. They can get yanked in like a day or linger for months. I eventually realized if I get the little giant ladder out and get it 12 feet up on a telephone pole, not many people are gonna bother getting up there. Like competitors are only so ambitious. So this was a good few years of advertising after flyers. I couldn't find that amateur flyer I mentioned, but this is a look at my more professional version. And I haven't sent any of these out in years. These were uh, how I went for the longest time. And how much do these cost, like the print? So again, this was years ago, but if you're getting hundreds or thousands made at a time, a single flyer comes down to pennies. It's all about buying in bulk. These, I want to say, if you buy 100 at, 
at time. They could be like maybe 13 bucks. Again, I'm a little cloudy on that because I've really pulled back on advertising for quite a few years now. Word of mouth, if you can get established, is huge. Everyone trusts their friends recommending services. Like your vehicle's already been test driven in a way. The final marketing that I've like entirely gone to, not surprisingly, online ads so facebook ads and then google ads that's been huge once you can actually pour money into a budget and you're specifically targeting areas to go to people that have searched for painting rather than blanketing a whole neighborhood and how much do you think you spend a month on that right now i've got it dialed down to zero because i'm only painting part-time but a few years ago in the height of it i could spend maybe 300 dollars a week on ads one thing i really loved about it is if you decide like you're burnt out i don't want to work the next few weeks you can just quickly, with a couple clicks, turn all your ads off, and then the phone's gonna mostly stop ringing. So, a lot of control there. Some people are intimidated by Google Ads, but it's uh, if you have a halfway decent website and some Google reviews, it's really the way to go. But the nice thing about the shed business is uh, it's cheap advertising. You can do a marketplace, Facebook, or your best advertisement that you can do. So we don't have much money in advertisement. You don't do any paid ads on like Google or nope. also on We've Facebook? We've done those before and they don't seem to work out for us. We do way better on marketplace and Facebook. And people are just going there searching for sheds or what are they searching for to find you? Sheds. They're putting in like utility shed, garden shed, whatever they like. And uh, our sheds pop up and other manufacturers pop up too. And then they price them out, call you and text you back and forth and away you go. Do you use Craigslist at all? Um, I don't. And why not? I think it's outdated and we just don't do well on it. I actually, in my almost five years, I think I've spent advertising wise like minimal dollars. We use social media, you know, we use Instagram, stuff like that. We don't have a huge following, but the following we have is engaged, you know, and they, they obviously take part in it. And we're, we're only growing that space, you know, we're only starting to, to advance it just a little bit. A lot of our leads and stuff like that just literally come from word of mouth. I love this place. I love the community. Great coaches. We get results. I'm gonna keep referring my friends and my family, and that's how it works. And we we incentivize sometimes to give people some free months and stuff like that, so they, you know, obviously get a little kickback from that. We've done very, very little to none, just because I, I think of that as disposable income. <laughs> because social media, a lot of it is free, and so that's what we've really been doing it as much as we possibly can. Every so often we may pay 10 or $15 for a Facebook or Instagram ad. EGR, Chris Freeman, he runs that and uh, has been a real help to us. But uh, he's, he has a really big voice in the area too and has helped with promoting us through social media quite a bit. Do you do any traditional advertising? Well, we've got a couple of flags we put out front and we've got some light up signs. Mm -hmm. And with the truck, I mean, most of it is word of mouth. Or when we're out at events, people will come to the truck and say, hey, you know, I, I, I plan events for such and such a company. Let me have your card. And, and, then, and then a lot of these are repeat. It's their annual events. So once you get it kind of going, after the second or third year, things start to repeat a little bit more. We know what to expect. We have a bit, uh, easier time booking, things like that. We don't advertise. We don't pay for advertising. I have a, I have a little kind of, I won't call it a rule, but it's kind of a rule. I refuse to pay for advertising. And I know how that sounds. And I know that people make a living based on that. Absolutely. But there's a lot of ways to get our name out there. The first one is just do good. Like if you come in here and eat dinner, hopefully you're suitably impressed and you like tell your friends and neighbors because we know that we have to knock it out of the park for people to tell thing, positive things to the people they know. We know we only have to mess up one tiny thing for them to tell everybody they know that we screwed it up, right? So we try to really knock it out of the park. Our food profile should be spot on. Cooking should be spot on. Our beer should be great. If we have bad beer, we dump it. Service. If we have bad food, we throw it away. If our servers aren't friendly or knowledgeable, we take them in the back and we educate them. I had to take a server back the other day and say, hey, hey, when, it, when a guest comes in, you first greet them. Don't say, can I get you a couple tastes of things? I said, because who's paying for that beer? I'm paying for that beer. I need you to say, hey, what do you normally drink? Because then if you know our beer at all, you can help them find something that appeals to their palate. So, and then we do a lot of social media. I'm a little worried about what's happening with the meta Facebook, Instagram thing. Um, we do have some plans for the new year. This is planning time really for me. So we have some plans for the new year with a new social media kind of campaigns, uh, maybe doing a few more TikTok-y sort of things. We make a lot of things from scratch and people want to know how to do things. We can teach them how to do things. So that's part of our plan as well. And we'll see how that pans out. We're busy, so yep.
hopefully doesn't fizzle and die, but that's the idea. We do a lot through social media. Um, you're really good at that. Thanks. Um, Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, a lot of just word of mouth, We've, you know, tried to provide a really, really great experience for people and something that they're willing to want to tell others about and kind of bring people with them. Yeah, our thought is that as long as we're providing the most, the best cider out there or the best tap room experience out there, people are going to talk about it. Um, and that's what we strive to do is just be the best we can possibly be. So in the past, I mean, we would post on social media, share it on Facebook. That was really about it. I tried a uh, flyer in a grocery store once and I did get one customer out of that. When I went full time, I made the decision to get a logo on my vehicle and then I got my trailer. And so the trailer had the decal on it. I had a small SUV at the time, uh, a trailblazer had that on there. Then when I got my, I had a truck, got that lettered, people see it around town. I'll get people that come find me on Lowe's. Hey, is that your truck out there? And it's another contractor wanting to talk. Or I had a lady call me this morning just to, to introduce herself and to say, we've seen your truck around town and we want to thank you for being a good example of a, of a, a tradesperson advertising that way, but also with how clean your vehicle is. Like you haven't seen the inside of it. I, I run a cabinet shop. But her point was that her husband runs a like a glass installation company, I think, and they have guys on their crew that just aren't keeping their trucks nice looking. And the whole point is people see it around town, they recognize it, and they're gonna, you know, that might be a way that they call you. And, um, I get people sometimes taking pictures when they pass me on the road or, you know, roll the window down. But other than that, just organic search on Google. I got Google My Business and I take a look at that. We have SEO on our website. It's not perfect, but it's decent enough for the size of our company. And we're currently working with a marketing agency in town um, to help us with targeted Facebook ads because we're looking to effectively expand our product line. So in Kalamazoo, we are known for cabinetry and built-ins and most of our clientele for cabinetry, actually all of our clientele is here in Kalamazoo. However, our furniture that we've made over the years, I can count on one hand how many pieces have gone to Kalamazoo. The rest have gone to Illinois, Grand Rapids, Metro Detroit. And really, I don't mind that we deliver across Michigan, but we want to be able to increase that where we're at and then outside as well. So we're working with the team to create uh, more conscientious advertising in that regard. And aside from our logo and, and decal and lettering on our truck and trailer, this will be the first time that we've actually paid for advertising. Do you have any tips for other painters that want to grow their business, like what you've done that you would recommend? I think being aware of your skill set. So if you decide tomorrow that you want to be a painter, don't try to get into a million dollar neighborhood and completely wreck the house. Know your abilities. If you own your property or if your landlord's cool with it, practice in your, at your place. Working, it's called when you're painting with the brush that's cutting in. If you can practice painting the wall where it intersects with the ceiling, that's how you can tell a painter's skill level, how straight that cut line is. Just starting on lower level projects, building up. One thing I've kept in mind with painting, I feel like reputation is everything. And so getting those first positive reviews online, when people search your company on Google, they see five stars. Even if you only have a handful of reviews, that's huge. So pride yourself in your work, know your skill level, and build from there. To grow the business, I would say take advantage of all the advertising you can, especially the free advertising out there like Marketplace. Even as little as yard signs is a big yeah. thing. I mean, it can change a lot. When I put yard signs out and have sales and stuff, it really makes a big difference. Would you recommend getting employees to grow your business? If you get to the point that you need them to grow the business, yes. Yep. And I wouldn't be afraid to do multiple businesses within uh, one facility. I think that's a great way to grow your business. One would be have patience. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money to grow a following and to understand which locations are profitable, which ones aren't, and what to focus on. Two, get ready for things to break. It's a commercial kitchen on wheels. All the equipment is not meant to be brought around on the food truck. There's 100, 200 things that could break and ruin an event. So getting, getting to places early and being ready with redundancies in place um, in case things break so you don't ruin a bride's day.
And the third thing is, I know you love food, but you have to focus on the numbers. There are so many food truck owners that are almost offended by profitability, but you're gonna go out of business if you don't focus on the profits. And people, I mean, sometimes they won't. Sometimes customers complain about your price. That's probably not a problem with your price. It's probably a problem with your product. So if you need to increase that perceived value in order to hit you know, the price that's gonna be profitable, do that. First tip I would say is have some mentors, have some individuals that you can continually bounce ideas off, other business owners that have created, created success and are winning every day. Because at the end of the day, like when I first started, it was, very eye-opening the, the shit I didn't know you know what I mean like I, I'm sitting here I'm like all right I got a four-year Bachelor of Science degree and I've got an MBA and I'm like all right I'm starting this business I've just ran a business I know how to do this and then it's like I, wait I gotta create this LLC I've got to learn how to file my taxes I've got to learn to you know use QuickBooks and I've got to learn to take pictures of all the stuff like expenses and all that stuff I didn't know so like a piece of it is like, you know, getting mentors, but also I would say like to find the right people that are behind you in your network. So finding a good accountant, finding a good legal person, um, you know, those are individuals that are going to be behind you and helping you through this process. So, you know, I wouldn't have known anything in terms of like how to do my taxes if it wasn't for my, my financial guy. Like that was huge. He's like, yeah, you need to do this, you need to do that, A, B, C, D, you know. So that that was a that was one thing that I would definitely recommend. Number two is start small and to continually grow it. So many people have this these aspirations of saying like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off this huge investment. I've got these investors. If you have investors, great. I would stay away from it as much as you can, right? Because you know, having someone outside of your world telling you what to do isn't the way you want right you know as an entrepreneur you're the, you're the individual you're the face of the business so you've got to make sure you've got it on tap so that's a, that's another piece but i would lastly say like patience like i'm not a patient guy and i i like i love like instant gratification most people do and i love like just crushing stuff and i've had to teach myself to really just all right this is the path this is what we're gonna do and we're just gonna grind it out every day and it's just gonna keep growing little by little by little by little. Give yourself time, more time than you think you need. Be patient. Be some patience. Yeah. And, uh, Expect some real ups and downs. Yep. Expect to wanna give up. Yep. <laughs> and just keep at it. Just do not And prepare give for the up. worst, but hope for the best. <laughs> and have some money, have some rainy day money because you're gonna need it. <laughs> Don't do this until your kids are grown up because this is a child in and of itself. We call it the twins because it's two guys. Uh, it's at, like having quadruplets or even quintuplets or octuplets because it's a lot. It wakes up in the night and cries the whole bit. It's a lot. So my biggest suggestion, every time I see our counterparts that have small children and I just think, I don't know how, they do I don't know how you do it. I'm so tired. Maybe because we're older too. I, I think one of the biggest ones is huge advantage for us is I have a menu that I wrote in 1991. None of that is here, but our our restaurant ownership started in 91, 92 um, is we did our homework. We knew our identity and it, it changed over time. Um, like I said, it was always going to be a restaurant for us, restaurant slash bar. I started home brewing in 96, 97, 97 sorry. as something, yeah, having spent years as a chef, it was, I wanted to learn how to do something. I, I love beer. I can figure out how to make it and got really good at it. And then the restaurant turned into, you know, maybe there's more to this than we thought. Um, so do your homework in a nutshell. Yeah. Do your homework. Well, and then the other, I think for me, the last part of it was particularly the brewery industry. It is it is a fun industry to be in. Um, it is exciting. There is potential to be relevant. There's not, a, you're not gonna get rich doing this unless you've got a lot of really big investors, which by the way- Take their money. Take their they money back, back eventually. Um, we know that there are a lot of breweries that have gone out of business. And I think the key is you can't sort of do this you're either in or you're out. 
You have to be all in or you're not going to be successful. It's a <clears> lot of work. And I don't know how people can have another full-time job and do this as well. It's, it's a lot. Don't think too much before you start your business. Just dive in because if you try to think too, overthink it, obviously you should have your business plan and you should think about whether or not this is even viable. But if you start to overanalyze, uh, thinking about whether this is going to be something that you really want to do, you're, you're probably never going to jump into anything. I think had we known how difficult this would have been, I don't know that we would be here. Yeah. On the flip side, though, once you reach a certain point, you're like, well, there's no choice but to make this a success <laughs> now because we're in so far, like, got to find a way to, to make this work. I would say the other piece would be to really do your research ahead of time about what it is that you're thinking of getting into. Trends come and go, things change, and the business itself, no matter how small, is tough to change quickly. Um, and so really be sure that this is something, it's sort of the, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If put in the work on the front end to figure out that this is, there's really demand here, this is something that you really want to do, that even when everything that you could possibly imagine could go wrong, that you still want to wake up the next morning and like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to tackle whatever these problems are, because you'll have days like that. You'll have days that are great also. Um, but it's really when you have some of those bad days and you have a few of them in the row that you need to make sure this is something that you are truly passionate about. I think going along that same line, having a partner to start it with or, or to, to be in business with, man, it that saved us several times because there have been times where I've wanted to give up and John hasn't or John's wanted to give up and I haven't. And that combination has helped us also stick through some of the tougher times, but it's also, I mean, when you have those amazing moments where everything comes together and it's like the best day, it's so much more fun to have that with a partner. Be hungry yet teachable, right? So you want to be able to like have a growth mindset. I want to grow in due time. I want to do the best things that I can to get a better quality product, make the processes more efficient and more lean, because if you can do it more productively and more lean, then as far as time goes, it's costing less per unit of time. So you're, you're making more in that sense. And then as far as always learning, I post on, on Instagram, for example, I don't get a lot of, I rarely get clients from Instagram, but I like it because of the woodworking community and I can connect with other makers and other cabinet makers across the country and you know pick things up that they're doing whether it's uh, guys who are strictly cabinet installers they'll point out hey you know we're doing this for this cabinet install this is why it makes sense and then i can think oh maybe i should include that in the next build because i'm going to have to install it so if i think in the process ahead of time that might benefit me you know i can see designs that others are coming up with and why they're doing it how they're putting it together so being teachable, wanting to learn, having the ability to take that initiative and do it. And then as far as launching a business, there's a, an amount of risk to it. You have to be willing to take that risk and step out in faith. For us, for my wife and I, our faith is really huge. Like it's the core thing for our business. And when we went full time, it was a huge leap of faith. When we went into this shop, it was a leap of faith. We've got a you know, leap of faith coming up with a big equipment purchase. And we're trusting that not only the Lord provides, but that the, the, the clients like the work that we do because of just how we've run the business so far.